Well, good morning. I want to say hello and welcome to Rivers of Love Church. This is the place where love flows and faith grows. We're so glad to have you joining us today. And we are excited about the word of God that he has prepared for us this year. We've been in a series that has been entitled Refreshed. Now, a lot of the times at the beginning of the year, you think about the things that you need to do and you think about the to do list that you have and those New Year's resolutions that you made. But we remember that it is important for us to be refreshed in the Holy Spirit, refreshed by God, making sure that he set us on the path anew before we get running on whatever goal that we have for the year. So we do have a word from God in the house this morning. If you would turn with me to the book of Acts chapter three. And we're going to start with the first verse and we'll land on the 10th verse. And this will be a familiar story to those that spent some time in Sunday school growing up. Or if you've been in church for a little bit of time, you probably heard this narrative. But I do want to look at this with a fresh set of eyes. So stick with me this day as we look at what happens here in Acts chapter three. And if you can do me a favor. I know you're watching this at home, but stand up on your feet to honor the reading of the word of God. Now, I know you may be in your bedroom, you might be in your PJs, you might even be in your kitchen, who knows where you may be. But I want you to stand up on your feet as we read this um, to honor the reading of the word of God and to keep you awake and keep you alert and uh, make sure that you're tuning in with us and locking in to what thus saith the Lord. And this is how it reads. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently and, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. Now, I want to talk to you today from the subject title refreshing your expectations. If you by yourself, tell yourself, refresh what you expect. If you with somebody, look at them intently and say, refresh what you expect. Let's pray. Father God, we pray today that you would speak a word to us. Lord, let us refresh our thinking, refresh our expectations, refresh what we believe you can do. In Jesus name. Amen. Now, one thing that most people have in common is the desire to progress. You won't find too many people that make it to the third grade and decide that they've reached the apex of what they can do in their life. People want to progress. People want to do better than they've done before. They don't want to be stuck at a certain place in their life where they don't feel like they could go any further. Most people have a desire to grow and to gain. But one thing that can stop and overshadow that desire to grow more and to gain more is a feeling of hopelessness, one that comes about by being stuck. That hopelessness will lead to the death of your expectations. At times we can see the same thing over and over again, so much so that our expectation begins to believe that that's all we'll ever get to the point where we believe that because we've experienced this so much that there's nothing better that's available for us anywhere that we go. Can anyone look at their life today and testify that they feel stuck? Feeling stuck. Say, I feel stuck in the things that I got going on in my life. I feel stuck and unable to move out of the place that I'm at right now. 
You had desires at one point in time, but because you didn't reach them when you thought that you would, now you feel stuck. You had desires to attain that degree at one point in time in your life. You knew that you were going to get that degree and you was going to be able to advance in your career and it was going to make you more money. And then all of a sudden, when you weren't able to get into that school that you wanted to, you had to go back to your job and you had to put those dreams to the side. And now you just feel stuck. Some of us managed to marry and have a spouse and we got together and we got to going through this honeymoon phase and all of a sudden, a few months into it, that honeymoon phase ended and you could begin to smell your spouse's breath in the morning a little bit. <laughs> you, you could see that they leave their clothes all around and they ain't putting up after themselves. And after you dealt with them for quite some time, instead of growing more in love with them, now all of a sudden you feel stuck. And if they with you right now, don't look at them. Don't look at them. Just keep looking forward. Keep listening to me. Now, understand that there are certain things that happen in our life that makes us feel like we're stuck and we don't have any room to improve. Like we're stuck at where we are and that is the place that we're bound to be. I can recall being at my first job out of college and I worked with several people and a lot of them were older than me. Some people had been working with the company for 20 plus years and they had really been with the company and had really understood the ins and outs of the things that took place there. And I recall meeting this one man and he had been with the company for a long, long time. Uh, probably by the time I was born, he was working his first day at the job. But he had been with the company for a long time and the crazy thing about it was every time that I talked to him, he always was complaining about how much he hated that job. He always was telling me that he could not stand that job. And I don't know what it is about my face that makes people want to express all of their uh, dissatisfaction, but apparently God blessed me with that. So he came to me every day and he would always tell me about what he couldn't stand, about what he did not like about that job. Well, after hearing this so long, I went to him and as he was complaining to me, I asked him, I was like, you know, there's a, a, a lot of things that, that you don't like about this job. Have you ever considered trying to get on at another place? You know, leaving this job and getting a new one? And would you believe that question stopped him in his tracks? He went from red hot fuming and ready to just blow up and expressing how unhappy he was to stopping and really thinking about why he was still at this job. And as he stopped and, and he was thinking, he said this to me, he said, once upon a time, I had hope of leaving. Once upon a time, I thought I could get out of this place and I wouldn't have to go through the things that I'm going through here anymore. But after a while of not getting out and not being able to get hired anywhere else, I just gave up hope. And I honestly feel like this is the only place I can be because at my age, nobody else is going to hire me. Nobody else is going to allow me to work for them at my age. Nobody else is going to start me off at my age. And he had accepted the negative environment that he was in. He accepted that was all that he was ever going to have. But the thing that made it so bad was that he had lost hope even when there was possibility for him to get hired somewhere else. It wasn't over there, even though. He felt like he couldn't get hired anywhere else. There were other people that were looking for highly experienced, qualified people to work at their jobs. <coughs> but because he had given up hope, because he said that no one will want to hire me, that is exactly what happened. No one was able to hire him because he didn't have the faith or expectation that anyone else would want to bring him on. In our scripture today, we find Peter and John headed to the temple to pray. Now, this is the same Peter that just a few weeks ago had cursed out a little girl because he was not trying to be affiliated with Jesus. He denied he even knew Jesus and he watched him die on that cross. And this was the same John that was super emotional at the crucifixion. And if anyone needed to be refreshed, they were people that needed their minds and expectations refreshed. Well, they got exactly what they needed just a few chapters before when Peter and John got the opportunity to experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit. 
and they received the Holy Spirit and this evangelical spirit came out of them when they got the Holy Spirit and they were able to bring 3,000 people into the church that day when the Holy Spirit came to them as they were praying in the upper room. And so they were still fired up. They were fired up on another level because you got to imagine that they went from being locked up in a room to preaching the gospel to thousands of people and thousands of people getting saved. So they were fired up. And as they're fired up, they said, let's go to the temple. Let's go to the temple and we're going to go to the prayer service and we're going to get the opportunity to continue what we began on the day of Pentecost. And so they're headed to the temple to pray and and outside they're seeing at this beautiful gate is what it's called. And this gate was really beautiful because they say that it was like 75 feet tall and it was just uh, impressive to look at. And it was such a beautiful scene, but the scene became less beautiful when you saw what was in front of the beautiful gate. See, there was this man who the Bible describes as someone who had been lame since birth meaning he had never been able to use his legs to walk. And because he never had the function of his legs, he had adjusted to just living life, being able to do what he had to do in order to live this second class life that he had been given. He never did anything to to try to excel and exceed beyond what was given to him and the circumstance that he was put in. He had just adjusted to the second class life. Even his friends had got accustomed to to supporting his lifestyle. They had become enablers of this second class lifestyle. We have to be very careful about the people that we allow in our lives that just enable this second class life when God has said we can live above and beyond those things that we find ourselves in today. We have to be careful that we don't surround ourselves with enablers, those people that drop us off today, those people that benefit from us not being who God has called us to be. And while it was nice of them to do to drop him off every day, this shows that his friends didn't believe that he was capable of anything more. His friends didn't believe that he could do anything more than it was easier for them to drop him off and let him beg than to put him behind a booth and let him sell things from a stool or let him be able to be a. You know, a tax collector was looked down upon, but that's somebody that could do their job sitting down. There were jobs that could be done without using his legs, but instead it was easier for them to just drop him off and leave him there and not have to worry about him learning a trade, but just having him beg. After 40 years of this, they had become enablers of his begging. That's what they did. They were there enabling him to live a second class lifestyle. You have to be very careful that you don't just allow people to enable you. You don't surround yourself with people that let you live second class life that doesn't allow you to live in the fullness of what God has prepared for you in this season. I don't want to be too hard on them about when I'm thinking about it, though, because at the very end of the day, it was easier for them to drop him off and For them to have always seen who he was for 40 years, being someone that was never able to use his legs, in their minds, they had come up with leaving him there as the easiest solution and what made sense for both of them because he was able to get food and eat for that day. And so I try not to be too hard on them when I really think about the circumstances that they're in. But let's remember that when God shows up, his power is shown in a greater way than we ever could have expected. God can reach beyond what our minds have the capacity to understand and do something greater than we ever could think would take place if we would adjust our expectations, not to what we see and not to what we've always experienced, but adjust our expectations to who God is. And that brings us to our first point. And I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. It's to set your expectations on the power of God. Set your expectations on the power of God. God is too great for us to just settle for less than what he has to offer us. To settle for less than the great things that he has planned for us in our lives. He's made too many promises to his children for us to be comfortable living below the standard. For us to be comfortable living below what God says belongs to us. We have to get to a place where we get, don't get so disappointed about 
the things in life that, that try to drain our faith, the letdowns that take place, the people that turn their back on us, the things that don't go our way. We get so caught up in these letdowns that we forget that God has given us the ability to do greater than we ever could have imagined and not allowing these failures that take place to damage our expectations. We often need to be spiritually refreshed and reminded of, of that life-altering power that, that God has available for us. When Peter and John walked up to the gate, the lame man, he locked eyes with them. And then he asked them for money after he locked eyes with them. Now, I'm fully aware how people be acting when they see homeless people on the side of the road. Um, if, if you're not saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, it's easy for you to see them looking at you and you look the other way. Or you look straight ahead and you stay at 10 and 2 because you don't want to lock eyes with them because, you know, if you lock eyes with them, they're going to come and, and, and knock on your window and try to get. OK, that, that, that's just me. That's OK. You know what? I'm not judging nobody. What you do in your car is your business. But especially if you don't have any money, the last thing you want to do is lock eyes with the person who's expecting money from you because that could create a real awkward situation with the person that's asking for you. Well, Peter and John, they obviously didn't know about these social norms and they did the exact opposite when the person that was asking for money locked eyes with them. They looked at them. Uh, they looked at the man who was begging and, and wanted money from them and, and they locked eyes with him, even though they did not have any money. And I'm sure the lame man got excited at this point that, that Peter and John actually responded because you'd be surprised how many people probably actually just walked right by him. They were so used to seeing him on a regular basis that they just walked right by and they didn't take time to even speak with him or give him anything. But they just walked right by. So it says when Peter and John looked at him um, because they, 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 they pointed him out and, and they got his attention that he eagerly expected some money. Now, one thing that we can appreciate about this, this lame man is that he was filled with expectation. That despite the things that had taken place in his life, that even if his expectations weren't to ever walk again or walk at all, he still had the expectation that these people that are going into the temple are coming in with some money. And if I ask, somebody is going to be willing to give me something. Some of us would benefit in our life if we did not give up our expectations completely. We may have a lowered expectation, but it's important that we hold on to something and do not fall into hopelessness where we believe nothing good can come our way. The enemy would love nothing more than to rid you of all your expectations, believing that nothing could happen. But if you would hold on to just a little bit of hope today, if you would say no matter what's taking place, I will hold on to the very word of God, even if it doesn't look like anything can materialize in my life, I will maintain just the hope that I can. Even if I'm going through sickness or sadness or financial hurt, no matter what's taking place, I'll hold on to the little bit that I got. I'll never allow myself to slip into a place of hopelessness. The enemy would love nothing more but than to rip you of your expectations that God can give you a good life. That, that expectation that he had, while it might not have been founded in the right place, it opened up the door for God to do something greater. It opened up the door for, for something to happen that he didn't even imagine was going to take place. And so Peter told the man to look at him, told him to look at him, to me, look at me. And he wanted to make sure that he had his full attention for what was about to take place. He tells him to... Probably his his upsetness that, uh, you know, I don't have any money. <laughs> he tells him, I don't have any money. But what he did have, he was going to give. He said, I don't have any money for you. So, you know, sorry about that. Now, a lot of us might have heard, I don't have any money and immediately turned away. You know, we might have said, well, that was what that was all I was expecting. So if you don't have that for me, then I'm going on about my way. But we have to get to a point where we don't limit God to what our expectations are, that we don't say, God, if you don't give me what I want, when I want it and how I want it, then I'm going on about my way. And I guess it wasn't meant for me. 
No, what we do is even if our expectations aren't met, that we stay and we hear what God has to say for our lives, because if it does not meet our expectation, it may be there to beat our expectation. So instead of getting to a point where we write off people immediately, when we don't get what we want, when we want it, we got to get stronger in our faith, believing that God can do something great, even if it's not what I said I wanted it to be. That God can do something greater even if it doesn't match up with the things that I had set in my mind. And so he tells them that he doesn't have any money, but he would, he would give them what he had. And then this was something that was going to be greater than he could have imagined. And so Peter speaks to him and he spoke to him and said, in the name of Jesus, the Amplified Bible says that that's the authority and power of Jesus. He says, rise up and walk. And that wasn't just it. He didn't stop by just giving them the command. Peter said, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost right now and things are about to change for those that are around me. So he grabbed his hand and he yanked them up. Peter and John grabbed him and, 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 and instead of just expecting what he always knew, he was able to shift his expectation to the power of of Jesus, the power and authority of Jesus. See, if we just allowed our minds to be refreshed in this truth and this and acknowledge the authority of Jesus, things would begin to change in our life. We would see miraculous changes taking place in our life. We would see things like cancer drying up. We would see things like relationships being mended, heartaches being re, uh, re, relieved. We would see things that were incredible if we would allow the authority of Jesus to change change our expectations. We have to expect in the name of Jesus that we'll have access to greater things than, than we've saw before. That in Jesus' name, that we'll rise up and we'll be able to walk. See, when he stood up, Luke tells us immediately, right away, immediately his foot and his ankle popped into place. Whew. That, that's beautiful detail. 40 years is a long time. But how many of you know that instantly, immediately, with that faith, God can completely alter your life? That immediately it can take place. That man wasn't, and he didn't have to get up and he didn't have to stumble around and he didn't have to find this footing. Immediately it popped in the place and he was able to walk. Allow him to refresh your thinking that immediately something can happen in your life. Allow him to refresh your expectations that immediately that place of lack can be filled. Immediately that place of brokenness can be healed. Immediately it can take place in your life if you would let it. If you would have the expectation, if you would have the faith to believe that God can do what he says he can do. Allow him to refresh your thinking and watch the faith lead you into things that you never could have believed. Directly following his healing, this, this, this formerly lame man, because I don't want to call him lame anymore when he's been healed, he literally jumps into action. He jumps into action. Verse 8 says, he jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Which brings me into my second point. Walk in the fullness of your blessing. That's somebody right there. Walk in the fullness of what God has given you. See, when, when he received this, this, this life-changing experience, he immediately put it to work. <coughs> he went to work immediately. He didn't wait. He said, this is the time. This is me. This is, this is the, the time that I have been given. And I've spent 40 years of my life sitting down. I'm putting it to work right now. He began walking and I know that he had got extremely excited and that brought about a renewed joy inside of him because then he started leaping. He started jumping up. He was he, he, so much that he, he wasn't walking. Walking alone wasn't going to do it. It was too much joy inside him. He had to start leaping and he started leaping and realizing the joy that he had from using his legs. His natural response was praising God. Saying, God, I before I spent my life looking at everybody else walking around, now that you've given me strength within my ankles, I'll run, I'll jump, I'll praise you so that everybody knows what you did for me. 
He was fully utilizing the gift that God had given him. Now, understand, it's your responsibility that when God exceeds your expectations and he's given you this gift that you did not deserve, that you praise God and give him the glory in that situation by utilizing what he gave you. You give God ultimate glory when you utilize the talent that he's given you. You give God ultimate glory when he's given you these things that you didn't expect, but yet and still he receives glory because everybody knows it wasn't because of you. They saw what you did. They saw what that man had done for 40 years. They saw what he was capable of, but when he walked in the fullness of what God had given him, God received all glory from the thing that had taken place. Don't half step into the blessing that God has given you. Don't halfway do it. Don't do no half stepping. When God has blessed you, fully utilize the things that he's given you. Leap into your purpose. Leap into that newness that God's blessed you with. Leap forward because you've been renewed through Christ Jesus. The scripture says he held on to Peter and John and they walked into the temple. He realized something that we all need to realize in our life. That when we do walk in the fullness of what God has blessed us with, that we need to be connected to some people that will be excited right there with us. We need to be connected to some people that are right on the same wavelength that we are on. See, one of the things that can really get on my nerves and can really annoy me is if I have some really exciting news and I run and I tell somebody something and they just write me off. Uh, I play fantasy football every year and um, I get really excited about, you know, um, certain matchups if I win by a certain margin or, you know, things are really close and I come out of a victory. So one day I went to work and I'm telling one of my friends at work about my fantasy football game and how I just barely won. I won by like half a point. And I'm so excited telling him this story. I'm going on and on about how my players were up and down all night and I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And then and finally I ended up winning. And uh, as I'm finishing my story, they look at me and their excitement isn't matching mine. And uh, as I'm looking at them, I'm wondering, you know what, you know, what's, uh, why are you not getting what I'm telling you? And their next question blew me out of the water. They said, what is fantasy football? I wasted my breath. I wasted my breath. I told them all of this about how excited I was and they had no clue I was talking about. They couldn't get with me. They couldn't get excited about it. In fact, it killed my entire mood. I had nothing else to say about fantasy the rest of the year. Um, I didn't even win that year, so it didn't matter. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is they destroyed my excitement because they weren't on the same wavelength as me. Understand that you don't need somebody who's a Debbie Downer in your life that can bring down your hypeness about what God has done for you in your life, that can bring down your mood about how God has blessed you in your life. You need some people on the same wavelength as you that can praise God when something good's happened to you, the same way you can praise God when something's good happening to them, and you can both glorify the name of God, understanding that he deserves the praise, deserving, he's deserving of all the honor, and that you can lift up on one accord, the mighty name of Jesus. Peter and John were, were the right men for him to be connected to. I need somebody equally as hype as me to be connected so we can be excited about how God good is, how good God has been for us. And so after experiencing God's goodness, the natural response of someone who's thankful is to praise the name of God. He's, his excitement and, and praise of God made the people look at him. They saw him jumping around. They saw him leaping. They saw him praising God. They saw what was going on with him. And as they noticed who he was, it began to shock them. They looked and they saw the man jumping. They said, what is he doing? He's distracting, making all this noise. And, and it, wait, that's, that's the, the, the baker? That's, <coughs> oh my goodness. That's, that is him. That's the one. And they were shocked. They were astounded. And that, that reaction that brings me to my final point is this. Your breakthrough can refresh others. Your breakthrough has the ability to refresh others. Look at verse 10 with me. In verse 10, it says, when they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They were shocked to see the man that was healed. They could not believe that the same man that had been there 
for 40 years. The same man that they had seen year after year, I should say, because I know he wasn't probably there as a child, but the same man they saw year after year, every time they walked into the temple, the same man, they were shocked to see him healed. Now, mind you, what they were doing at the temple. They were going into the temple to pray. They were going into the temple to honor God and praise God with the things that they had. They were going into the temple to do those things. And so they had faith enough to pray. They had faith enough to go in there and make sacrifices. But they did not have faith enough to believe that the God that they were praying to was able to heal. How do I know that? Because look at their response. Their response was absolutely astounded, absolutely flabbergasted. Their minds were blown at the fact that this man was walking around, that God had actually healed him. And it makes me wonder, how many of us have gotten so used to the ritual of coming to church, so used to the ritual of prayer, so used to the ritual of reading my Bible that I forget the power that's behind it? That I forget that there's real wonder-working power in the God that I serve. That I'm not just doing this out of habit. I'm not just doing this because I've always done it. I'm doing this because I believe the God that I serve is great and mighty and he can do miracles in my life. We got to refresh our way of thinking within the church. We got to remember that we're not just praying to do it because it sounds cool. Or we're not just praying to do it because somebody told us it was a good idea. That we're praying because God hears us and that God is able to work out a miracle within our lives. The people got to have their expectations in God renewed when they saw this miracle. They got to see what God can do. They got to remember what God could really do. And the reason why they were offering these sacrifices and the reason why they were praying to God is because God is real and God is able to do real things. That he's not a hypothetical construct or concept in our minds, but he's a real God that does real things. We need to be reminded about Ephesians 3 and 20 that that, that says now unto him who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to the power that's working in us. We have to remember that just like it says in Revelations 4.11, that you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and to receive honor and to receive power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. We have to remember those things because the power of God will remind us where to set our expectations. The power of God will remind us that these things that we're settling for that are less than what he's able to do are unacceptable that we got to get to a point where we remember to have faith because we have faith in someone who is faithful. We have to remember his power and what he's able to do, and it'll begin to refresh not only our faith, but also our point of view on whatever situation that we're going through. It'll bring us to the next level. It'll remind us not to settle. You know, God says that, that, that we're the head and not the tail, If we don't settle for last place, if we're above and not beneath, we don't settle for less than what the kingdom has to offer for us. We remember that his power is superior to the things that we go through on this earth. Today, we have to remember our our miracle is never just going to be for us. It's never just going to be for us. After this miracle took place, Peter got the opportunity to go and preach to more people as they were shocked about what had taken place, but he had the opportunity to refresh and renew their thinking and refresh and renew what they expected to receive. See, he offered them Jesus, and that led to the cleansing of their souls and the renewing of their minds. So my question to you is simple today. Will you let your expectations be shifted? Will you allow God to shift your expectations and give you more than what you expected? Or will you be so stuck in what you've always done and refuse to believe that God is able to do more? Don't get stuck in that pattern or stuck in the situation that you've been in. But today, allow the spirit of Jesus to to open your life to receive all that he has for you. If you'd allow me to, I'd love to pray for you wherever you may be right now. 
Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of it. Lord, I thank you that, that you are an awesome God that does more than we can ask or imagine. I pray today, Lord, that everyone who's under the sound of my voice, that they would be able to receive from you what you have for them, Lord God, that they wouldn't let their expectations get in the way of the plan that you have for them. We give you thanks, believing even now that you're moving in lives. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we end this time together, I want to give you an opportunity to do something amazing. And that is for those that have never put their trust in the loving Savior that is Jesus Christ, or even for those that at one point in time had accepted Christ and have moved away right now, and you say that I want to be in right relationship with someone who's able to shift my expectations. Well, if that's you today, we're going to say this prayer. And if you're at home with us, I want you to pray this prayer with us. Now, there's nothing magical about this prayer, but what this is, is making a proclamation that you're returning home and that you're going to follow a God that cares about you and a Savior that loves you. So if you're wanting to make that decision today, I'm going to pray this prayer, and I just want you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe I was born into sin, but you died for my sins. I accept what you did on the cross. I accept your forgiveness. And I, today, I make you my Lord and Savior. I give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Simple prayer, but if you prayed that prayer today, life-altering, life-changing things are getting ready to happen for you. If your situation persists, it, your perspective will be changed and your positioning will be changed so you'll be able to have peace no matter what's going on in your life. But I believe in great things as you've accepted Christ and I know that your life will be changed for the better. And today, before we leave, I want to give you the opportunity if you'd love to partner with us or you, you love what we're doing here and you are excited about what God is doing right here at Rivers of Love and you decide that you want to partner with us, um, well, we're going to give you some ways that you can give. Uh, they'll be on the screen right there for you to see. Also, um, we want to connect with you. Um, we definitely want to have an opportunity to let you be in on all the things that we're doing here at Rivers of Love. Um, there'll be a number that's also on the bottom of the screen that you're able to text to and you'll be able to get updates on everything that's taking place here at Rivers of Love. Um, again, I want you to know that I love you, but God loves you even more than that. I want you to make sure that you get out and get connected and just know that God is working for you on your behalf. God bless you.